Welcome to today's tutorial all about sutures. I believe that sutures are a very important topic for any medical student to know about as you can often be asked about them either by surgeons or by examiners. And hopefully today's tutorial will provide you with some information as well as a framework with which you can articulate your knowledge in a clear and concise manner. The tutorial itself will begin by focusing on the principles of healing itself and then we'll do a deep dive on sutures. Um, think about healing, there's two main ways of healing. Healing by primary intention or healing by secondary intention. Healing by primary intention is where you bring either edge of the wound together and fix it in place. And this can be done by a number of different things, such as surgical staples, surgical tape, biological adhesives or sutures. Healing by secondary intention, on the other hand, is where you leave the wound to heal in its own time and don't bring the, the edges of the wound together. And there's a number of reasons why you might wish to do this. For example, the wound may be very small, there may be fears of contamination in the wound, or there may be involvement of secondary degree burns on the wound, in which case you would opt to heal by secondary intention. Think about the suture itself, as I'm sure you all know. A suture cons consists of two different components the needle as well as the thread. And as long as you think about the suture in this way, you won't go very far wrong. And that's how we'll structure the tutorial. Starting off thinking about the thread, as most people are taught about in medical school, you can think about the thread in terms of the material, the thickness, and the composition in terms of the filaments. Sutures can be either made of synthetic materials or natural materials. And increasingly there's a move towards synthetic materials due to their advantages. Examples of natural materials include silk, that's made by silkworms, or catgut, that's made from the gut of cattle. As I mentioned, uh, convention is moving towards synthetic materials due to their improved profiles in terms of tissue reactivity um, and versatility. Um, specifically with silk, there's fears or concerns with tissue reactivity, and also with catgut, there's fears about prion transmission and BCE, BCE transmission, which is why uh, these are less and less in fashion. Think about synthetic materials. You can talk about them in terms of their absorption profile. They can either be absorbable or non-absorbable. And this purely refers to how the suture material behaves in tissue over time. Examples of absorbable materials include PDS and proline. And examples of non-absorbable material includes nylon. Now an absorbable suture uh, when you leave it in the, in the tissue over time, it will break down either by, by being dissolved or by proteolytic enzymatic breakdown. Whereas in contrast, a non-absorbable suture will stay in place over time and will have to be removed manually by the operator 7 to 10 days after insertion. You, you tend to use um, absorbable sutures on deeper structures and, and not to use them on, on superficial structures. And this is because as, it, as the suture material dissolves or is broken down over time, it leads to tissue contracture. And if you were to use this on the skin, this would lead to skin contractures and unsightly scars. Therefore, you use non-absorbable sutures on the skin and absorbable sutures on deeper structures. There are exceptions to this rule. For example, with children, you may not wish to insert the non-absorbable sutures as it can be quite fidgety and difficult to remove them 10 days later. So, if the wound is on an area of little cosmetic impact, you may wish to insert the absorbable suture and allow it to heal on its own. <coughs> Another way to think about the suture material itself is in terms of the thickness or the caliber of the suture. And sutures range in thickness from 11-0, which is the smallest, all the way to 6. And this classification is often quite confusing, but I'll explain how this originated. Initially, we were only be able to create sutures from uh, a size 0 to size 6, and 0 was the smallest suture we could create. Now, as technology advanced, uh, we were able to create sutures of smaller thickness. And, and the smaller than the 0, we termed 0, 0, or 2, 0. Oh. As technology advanced further, we were able to create smaller and smaller sutures, up to a point where we created a suture with 11 zeros, and this was termed 11, 0. Oh. Hence why 11O is smaller than 2O, and so on and so forth. Now obviously the reason why we use different calibered sutures vary upon the situation. 
we use a, a size 6 suture for example in orthopedic surgery where you have to bring together large amounts of tissue together whereas we reserve 11 for more uh, fine or smaller surgeries for some example with microvascular anastomosis or ophthalmic surgery where the structures are more delicate. In practice most clinicians would use a size um, 3 O to 5 O suture uh, to suture up skin uh, or other tissues and if you're suturing on the face you would use uh, a caliber between 4 O and 6 O so it's this sort of range which you might be asked to suture. Finally in terms of thread the best thing the last thing to think about is composition in terms of filaments and this refers to how many filaments make up the suture. Certain sutures are monofilamentous which means that there's a single filament which makes up the entire suture whereas others are braided which means there's many different filaments interweaving uh, in, in a braided fashion. Now obviously there are certain properties and advantages and disadvantages that result are a result of these different compositions. So for example a, a monofilamentous suture uh, as it's a single filament, passes through the skin more easily and is less traumatic. And this is very, very useful for superficial structures where you need minimal trauma to the tissue. Uh, the disadvantage is it's quite slippery to handle in the hands, and therefore uh, a braided suture is better if you're wishing to tie knots manually. Uh, due to the braided nature, there's also improved tensile strength with braided sutures. However, the key disadvantage is uh, the wick effect. And what this means is the areas where each filament overlaps the small pockets where tissue fluid can accumulate and as you know uh, accumulated tissue fluid on a synthetic medium is an ideal uh, recipe for tissue infection as micro microorganisms can settle in these areas and thrive in the tissue fluid and that results in a greater degree of tissue wound infection with braided sutures as compared to the monofilamentous sutures so that's everything you need to know about the thread. Thinking now about the needle, there's three things again you need to think about and a lot less to be said about them. The shape of a needle can either be curved or it can be straight. Now the majority of needles are curved. I've only ever seen straight needles used in obstetrics and gynecology when used to suture up a lady after a caesarean section. But the majority will be curved. And the curvature can be half circle, quarter circle, three quarter circle, and all of this information will be seen on the suture pack itself. The length, there's not very much to be said about this apart from it refers to the length of needle. So with a straight needle it's the straight length and with a curved needle it's the arc length. So there's not much to be said about the length. The most interesting aspect of a needle is the point geometry and this refers to the cross section of the needle if you were to cut it. And there are different types of point geometries. They can be cutting edges but they can be non-cutting edges and I'll explain what this means. So, if we took a needle and we to cut right through it and have a look at it from this end, the point geometry refers to what the cross section would look like. And would be s information about this would be demonstrated on each suture pack uh, with a symbol that looks something like this. So if we take the needle and the inside edge was sharp as well as the point, this is called an inside cutting edge. If the outside edge was sharp, as well as the point, that's called the outside cutting edge. And occasionally you can get needles with three sharp edges along with a sharp tip. And this is called a tapered needle, or a side cutting edge, as is three cutting edges. Now we use cutting edges to allow the needle to pass more easily through the tissue with less trauma. And as we know, this is most likely used for superficial structures like the, like the skin where you'd like to reduce scar formation. Therefore, cutting edges are more used for the skin, and non-cutting edges are used for deeper structures such as bowel anastomoses. Non-cutting edge would be where there's just a sharp point and a smooth edge, and this is known as a trocar needle. So that's everything you need to know about needles and threads. A final thing of interest is how they fit together. Um, now, in modern medicine, every single suture I've ever seen has been swaged, which means the needle is already attached to the thread as you take it out of the pack. However, in the olden days, uh, there used to be unswaged needles where the, the operator would manually have to thread the needle. Now, obviously, this has a number of disadvantages. For example, 
um, it takes longer to thread a needle. There's increased risk of needle stick injuries as the operator tries to thread a needle. And also, the needle has to be larger to accommodate a thread, and therefore it's more traumatic. The only key advantage of unswaged needle, however, is the fact that you can customize the needle with the thread. But due to the, the vast advantages of swage needles, this tends to be the preferable method nowadays. So that is absolutely everything that you need to know about sutures. Hopefully in this tutorial you've come to realize that uh, whilst there's lots to be said about sutures, as long as you think about it in a simple manner, uh, you can elaborate on them for as long as you wish. Um, all of the information from this tutorial is available on a download. If you go to our website www.f121.com, you'll see a, a PDF which you can download with all of this information. And if you like this video, uh, feel free to comment in the comment section below or visit our website or subscribe where you'll see more videos like this.